so social epistemology uh, is a, uh, uh, an interdisciplinary field which uh, in a way I've pioneered. I'm not the person to have coined the phrase social epistemology, but uh, in a way it's a kind of strange idea because uh, in the history of philosophy, epistemology has normally been seen as the theory of knowledge, but usually understood in a very individualistic kind of way. So in other words, the relationship between the individual and the external world. Uh, social epistemology implies that somehow that's not the right way to begin the problem of what the issue about knowledge is. And so the point is that somehow we need a kind of collective understanding of how the world is before we can talk about it. And this is kind of what social epistemology is about in a basic kind of way. Now within uh, academic disciplines, uh, it turns out that uh, philosophy has gone in a very individualistic way with regard to epistemology, where, if, where uh, the social sciences and sociology in particular have had a more collectivist way of thinking about the nature of knowledge. So it's been inherently more social. But what I found out entering into the field in the late 1980s was that, uh, in fact, the normative aspect of knowledge, that is to say what knowledge ought to be, was in a sense very much understood in individualistic terms. In other words, in terms of what I should know. But it wasn't in so much in terms of what we should know in terms of some kind of collective understanding. This was largely left to uh, history, sociology, other social science disciplines, which often were just talking about knowledge in a purely descriptive way. That is to say, talking about how people understand the world normally, how they've understood it in the past, but not necessarily how knowledge should be understood in the future. And so my conception of social epistemology was very much about thinking, how can we take this kind of empirically grounded knowledge about how we understand the world and how we've understood it in the past in a way that could actually benefit people in the future so that we can take decisions about how we should go. And you see, that the thing that's interesting about the history of epistemology as, as a field of knowledge is that when we talk about decisions, right, what we should do on the basis of what we should believe, historically this has been very much focused as an individual issue, not as a collective issue. Now of course in politics there's a completely different way of looking at the matter, but within philosophy there's still a kind of struggle to say that when we're talking about decision making, it shouldn't just be individualistic, but it should be collective. And then the question becomes, what's the appropriate way in which a collective decision should be made about the future of knowledge? And so when we talk about knowledge in this sense, we're not just talking about what is true here and now, but what we're talking about is the kinds of truths that are going to matter for the kind of world we want to build together. Okay? So there's a collective social element in this. And uh, tr traditionally, both philosophy and sociology have not really addressed this question quite properly. They've addressed it, you might say, partially. Okay? So um, my approach, and, st and, and so I, I uh, published this book, which was the first book on social epistemology, uh, in, in 1988 um, was about trying to bring these kind of perspectives together. So in other words, saying that there is a serious problem of knowledge. In a way, it's kind of the problem that philosophers had, have traditionally dealt with, but philosophers have dealt with it purely at an individualistic level, whereas we need to bring a collective understanding if we're talking about all of humanity. Okay, um, and uh, what this has meant in practice, in terms of what social epistemology does as a research program, um, is that we've tended to focus on um, things like, and I'll just uh, I'll mention my uh, my own work first. Uh, 
academic disciplines, for example. Uh, and so looking at the way in which you start to get groups of people who start to study things in a very particular way, start organizing and pr producing these kind of self-contained communities, which then become the basis on which recognize, externally recognized forms of knowledge are produced. Okay? Um, and you might say this is kind of the way in which expertise gets developed. And academic knowledge is a great example of that kind of thing. But then that raises an additional problem, uh, which is how then, if you've got a certain group of people who in a certain sense have captured a range of reality and have made it a form of knowledge, how are those people then made accountable to some larger group outside of it who might depend on that form of knowledge? Okay? Um, and this is where the issue of uh, wh why social epistemology is so much uh, involved with issues having to do with democracy and the accountability of knowledge. Because I think there's a general, recogni a general recognition that knowledge is something that in the first instance is produced by a relatively elite group of people. But then the question becomes, how are those elite made accountable to a larger society that in a sense depends upon the knowledge that those elite produce. And I think this is the question that we're faced with today with regard to social epistemology. And there's a lot of different kinds of political contexts in which this question is being pursued around the world. But nevertheless, I think this is quite a fundamental question and one that will remain with us in the future.